Hi, this is Matt McCormick. I'm in the Department of Philosophy at California State University, Sacramento, and this is a lecture for my Philosophy of Mind course. We've been talking about introspection. We have looked at Descartes' view of how we're able to infallibly, incorrigibly introspect uh, the mind and know the contents thereof. We've also talked about Nisbet and DeCamp Wilson's empirical research about the reliability of people's verbal reports of um, higher order mental processing. And Eric Schweitzgebel has got an important article I'm going to talk about today called The Unreliabil Unreliability of Naive Introspection. And here's Schweitzgebel's position. Um, he thinks, uh, interestingly, there's a bit of conflict here, the introspection of current conscious experience, when I look in and in and I'm aware of my current phenomenal subjective feelings is both possible, important, necessary for a full life, and central to the development of a full scientific understanding of the mind, and it is highly untrustworthy. So unfortunately, we've, we're stuck with both. We have no reliable means of learning about our own ongoing conscious experience our current imagery, our inward sensations, we are as in the dark about that as anything else, perhaps even more so. So one of the really powerful things about Schweitzgebel's position is that um, he completely inverts the Cartesian position. Descartes thought that my introspection, introspected awareness of my internal states was incorrigible and was the most reliable, the most trustworthy experience I have and that my awareness or knowledge of objects outside of me or my external experience was less reliable. And Schweitzgebel wants to turn that around and say, no, on the contrary, I can tell you much with much more reliability how many car, how many wheels a car has or what color the tree is or what, what's going on outside the world. But if it comes to reporting on what's going on inside me, I'm in, you know, I'm in the dark. So the amazing thing is the argument that gets him to this conclusion. Okay, so it's an anti-introspectionist anti position. Most people who are poor introspectors of their own, sorry, most people are poor introspectors of their own ongoing conscious experience, Schweitzgebel argues, we can't assess the causes of our mental states or processes. And that's consistent with what we saw in Nisbet and Camp Wilson. We make, says Schweitzgebel, gross enduring mistakes about even the most basic features of our currently ongoing conscious experience, even in favorable circumstances of careful reflection with distressing regularity. You don't know nearly as much about uh, what's going on in you as you think you do. So he's got an even deeper skepticism than Nisbet and DeCamp Wilson had, but it's one thing not to know why you chose a particular pair of socks, to use an example from Nisbet and DeCamp Wilson, and quite another to be unable accurately to determine your currently ongoing visual experience as you look at those socks. Your auditory experience as the interviewer asks you the question, the experience of pain in your back making you want to sit down, few philosophers or psychologists express plain and general pessimism about the latter sorts of judgment. So he's aggravated that skeptical philosophers ought to be more skeptical about this thing that's been left um, sacrosanct. Okay, so let me make a distinction between infallibilism and fallibilism. Infallibilism is the view that we cannot err in our judgments about our own current conscious experience. So that's the position he's attacking. Fallibilism, fallibilists generally continue to assume that in favorable conditions, circumstances, careful introspection can reliably reveal at least the broad outlines of one's currently ongoing experience. So Schweitzgebel is going to take issue even with the fallibilists. He doesn't even think that's true. Even skeptical philosophers are too generous, he says. Paul Churchland puts it on a par with an accuracy of sense perception. Dan Dennett says that we can come close as close to infallibility when we are charitably interpreted. And he asks, Schweitzgebel asks, where are the firebrands? Why is nobody more skeptical or uh, provocative about this point? <clears throat> So the first kind of emotional, first kind of infallibilism he wants to consider is emotional infallibilism, and that's this view, and I think before you reflect on it very much, most of us have this view, that I can infallibly introspect my own emotional states. So 
I know if I'm mad, for example, or I know if I'm sad, or I know if I'm depressed. Just So just first order reports about how I'm feeling. Okay, so here's the problem with that position. If emotional infallibilism is true, then we shouldn't be able to sensibly ask these questions. So here's the questions. Are emotional states like joy, anger, and fear always felt phenomenally? That is, as part of one, part of one stream of conscious experience, or only sometimes? So do, is the question even meaningful? Uh, Schweitzkill's position is that the question makes sense. The question's meaningful. So do I always feel joy as a kind of similar, a current phenomenal feel inside my conscious experience or sometimes is it something else sometimes is joy diffuse or outside or of a different shape or uh, come to me does my joy come to me by a different route which seems at least possible to ask that question are they always part of the stream of conscious experience? Is their phenomenology, their experiential character, always more or less the same? Those are all questions I can ask about my joy. And if I can ask those questions, then it would appear that emotional infallibilism has got to be mistaken. Because look, infallibilism says that when I look in, I see my feelings and I know exactly what they are. And there's no room, there's no gap, there's no space for there to be anything um, uh, messy about that or any uh, mistakes about that. But we can at least ask that question, suggesting that infallibilism can't be right. There's a gap, there's a gap there. There's a gap of daylight between um, uh, my feelings and these questions. Answering questions about cars or trees is trivially easy, says Schweitzgibble by comparison. How many wheels are there on a car? That's easy. I can picture that in my head and I can tell you whether that, what, what's true about it. Um, what is my joy like? Is my joy always the same? Is it, does it feel the same in my phenomenal experience when I'm having it? My anger. My anger has a different shape to it. It has a different flavor to it. Oh, one kind of anger is different than other kinds of anger. Um, in fact, it's so diverse when I start to reflect on it that it's, there's hardly anything similar about it at all, which certainly raises... Um, doubts about this infallibilist claim. Okay, so is joy sometimes in the head, sometimes more visceral, sometimes a thrill, sometimes an expansiveness? Surely it is, as he's suggesting. Or instead, does joy have a single, consistent core, a distinctive, identifiable, unique, experiential character? And I think Schweitzgebel doubts the latter. He doesn't think that's right. He thinks the, the former is right. And it seems right to me, too, when I think it through. Is emotional experience consistently located in space? For example, particular places in the interior of one's head and body? And I don't think so. I think it's diffuse. I think it has a different character every time I have it. Compare to your sensory experience of looking at a river. Which way is the water flowing? Which direction? Those are clear. That's quite succinct. That's very specific. It's absolutely sharp in my visual experience, but joy is, does, doesn't have any of those features. Recall some anger or other emotional state to mind. Maybe you're having it right now. What is that like, that anger, that feeling? Tell me the details of the phenomenal experience. I don't have any idea what I'm feeling in these cases. I just have the feeling, and I struggle to try to describe it, and I struggle to draw out what the connection is between the different cases. If infallibilism were true, says Schweitzgebel, these questions would be easy to answer. The qualitative character of the emotion is not entirely evident to introspection. It's always a kind of murky mishmash of inference, vague feeling, kind of similar remembered feeling to other feelings. We don't know what brings us pleasure or suffering. Do you really enjoy Christmas? Does it even make sense as a question? It does make sense as a question. You might realize suddenly that you don't enjoy it when you thought you did. Do you really feel bad while doing the dishes? Are you happier weeding or going to a restaurant with your family? So I can ask you that question, you can give one answer, and you can have the experience and have yet another answer. And that suggests that there's a gap between what it is you feel and, um, and the reporting of it. You don't actually know, or at least you don't know infallibly so. 
you could be wrong about enjoying Christmas. I mean, you've changed your mind. You've realized, wait a minute, I don't enjoy this thing I said that I enjoy. Or I, I'm not actually enjoying it at all, where it's flipped on you. Okay, so that's Schweitz Gebel's um, suggestive leading questions that are supposed to get you to start to doubt emotional infallibilism. Now he's going to give an argument, to, uh, or at least to ask a bunch of sort of powerful suggestive questions to get you to doubt um, your current experience. So your em reporting on emotions is one thing. Reporting on your current experience is a more general claim, and he wants to attack current experience infallibilism. But I can't be wrong about my ongoing conscious experience, right? Surely I'm not wrong about that, even if I'm wrong about my emotions. And sh to which Schweitzgebel says, I'm sorry for using such a long quote, but it's a very good uh, suggestive passage. He says, reflect on, introspect your own ongoing emotional experience at this instant. Do you even have any? Is it completely obvious to you what the character of that experience is? Does introspection reveal it to you as clearly as visual observation reveals the presence of the text before your eyes? Can you discern its gross and fine features through introspection as easily and confidently as you can through vision discern um, the gross and fine features of nearby external objects? Can you trace it spatially? its viscerality or its cognitiveness, its involvement with co conscious Im imagery, thought, proprioception, or whatever, as sharply and infallibly as you can discern the shape, texture, and color of your desk. And it's a long, hard question, but the answer is no. The sh the, 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 your, uh, on your current conscious internal experience is not nearly as clear to you um, as those external uh, experience features are. Uh, what about anger? Do you know when, why, or how you're anger? You deny it when your partner says it. You say it's because of X when it's actually because of Y. You don't even understand why you're angry a day later. You can't access it. You can't unpack it. You believe that you're not when you are. Then you're mistaken about the causes. We often make mistakes and admit to being mistaken about um, our reporting of why I'm angry from the inside. So here's Schweitzgebel's argument. If emotional infallibilism were true, then we wouldn't be able to ask these questions. We wouldn't make mistakes about the state we're in, and we wouldn't be mistaken about the causes of those states. But we can ask these questions, we make mistakes, and we are mistaken about the causes. Therefore, emotional infallibilism isn't true. We are not infallible judges of our own emotional experience. Okay, what about current sensory state infallibilism? Uh, what about me reporting on what I'm currently feeling? Um, can I be infallible about that? Surely my current access to a simple sensory state like red cannot be mistaken or confused in the ways that Schweitzgebel has said that we're confused about our emotions. Well, actually, suppose I'm looking directly at a nearby bright red object in good light, and I judge that I'm having the vis visual phenomenology, the quote-unquote inward experience of redness. How could I be wrong about that? That seems like one of the classics of sort of modern philosophy of mind. Surely that's something that I couldn't possibly be make, make mistakes about. Um, so let's call that sensory experience infallibilism. And, and Schweitzgebel points out that when you have dreams, you sense impossible things. I can protrude my tongue without its coming out. I think I see red carpet that's not red. I see a seal as my sister without noticing any difficulty about that. You have sensation of completely impossible things. So that suggests that there's something amiss or something awry about what's going on in here. Um, morphine patients, and this is an example from Daniel Dennett, report being in pain that's not unpleasant, which is staggering to the emotional, or sorry, to the sensory experience infallibilist. Um, pain is a, an atomic uh, a uniform, monolithic, qualitative state, and it is by its nature unpleasant. How could you report being in pain that doesn't feel bad? How is that even pain? But morphine patients acknowledge that it's pain, it just doesn't feel bad. Suggesting that there's a gap here or a possibility of pulling something apart that we didn't realize we could pull apart, and if it can be pull, pulled apart, then it's not infallible. 
absolute security and immunity to skeptical doubt, thus elude even obvious introspective judgments as well as perceptual ones. Um, and Daniel Dennett's got a famous example that I sometimes do in class. Um, you can try this. I don't have a card available, but get a playing card um, or a deck of cards. Pull a card out of the deck and keep the face down so that you can't see it. And then hold the card out to your side with the face pointing back and wiggle the card as you slowly move it up into your peripheral vision. And at some point, you'll be able to see the card moving, and you'll know that it's moving in your peripheral vision, but you won't be able to see the color. That is, you can see movement without color, which to the sensory experienced infallibilist or somebody like Descartes seems completely implausible, utterly uh, impossible. How could something be moving and not be colored or not be filled in? But you can actually have the experience easily yourself just by running the experiment. Um, so Schweitzgebel says, look, the clarity or the vividness of visual experiences is itself an illusion. It's being tricked. Uh, your brain is tricking you on this. Visual experience isn't as sharp and detailed as we think it is. When the thought occurs to you to reflect on some part of your visual phenomenology, you normally move your eyes. You foveate them in that direction. You think to go look at um, the car keys on the table or look at the glass on the table. Consequently, wherever you think to attend, wherever you move your eyes, within a certain range of natural foveal movement, you find the clarity and precision of foveal vision, because that's where you're looking. Wherever you look, that's where you're looking with clarity. It's as though you look at your desk and ask yourself, is the stapler clear? Yes. Is the pen clear? Yes. The artificial wood grain between them and the mouse pad, are they clear? Yes. Yes, each time looking directly at the object in question, and then you conclude that they are all clear simultaneously. But in fact, they only jump out and become clear as you direct your attention at them. It's not your full field of vision that looks like that. Like right now, I'm looking straight at the camera, and it's sharp and clear and distinct for me. Everything else is vague, blurry, um, and remains so until I focus some attention on it and sharpen it up with my attention. So, and in fact, uh, Schweitzgebel suggests that we can train ourselves to do this unattended looking, which is really bizarre. We can pry foveation apart from introspection. You can let your eyes randomly move around your field of vision without actually attending to that which is in the field or in the focus of the, the foveation. Fixate on some point in the distance, he says holding your eyes steady while you reflect on your visual experience outside the narrow, narrow fovea. So you look at the object in the distance, and now think about the things that are not in the center of your attention. Now, better, direct your introspective energies away from the fovea while your eyes continue to move around normally. This may require a bit of practice. You might start by keeping one part of your visual field steady in mind, allowing your eyes to foveate anywhere over there. Take a book in your hands and let your eyes saccade around the cover while you think about your visual experience in the regions away from the precise um, points of fixation. And you can actually separate the two so that your eyes are moving around, but the, but the focus is, um, uh, remains in the other place. So the result then is this, this sort of outrageous question, how could I be wrong about what I'm seeing? Most of the people who attempt these exercises, says Schweitzgebel, eventually conclude that visual experience does not consist of a broad, stable field, flush with precise detail, hazy only at the borders. Instead, they discover that the center of clarity is tiny, it's shifting rapidly around a rather indistinct background, and my interlocutors, the people who are skeptical about Schweitzgebel's position, most of them, confess to error and having originally thought otherwise. So Schweitzgebel's run this experiment and pressed people over and over on this and tried to see if they think this is right, and they give up and say, no, actually, I was probably wrong. But wait a minute. How could you confess to an error about this? If there can be any doubt or question here, then the prospect of infallible, immediate, direct access to my mental contents is out. That is, immediate sensory state. Infallibilism has got to be wrong because look at what you just did. You just split out the clarity from the thing you're looking at. What about my current thoughts? Can I be clear and sharp and have infallibility about those? Okay, well think of the Prince of Wales or whatever you want to think about. 
Was there something it was like to have that particular thought? Set aside any visual or auditory imagery you may have had. What was it to think of the Prince of Wales? Now, I currently can't really remember what he looks like. I guess I'm, I'm thinking of Charles. Um, and I can kind of see the big ears. But if I set those aside, um, there for a moment, when I first read the sentence, I knew that I was thinking of the Prince of Wales because Schweitzgibble told me to do it, and I was just doing it for the exercise. Was there something it was like? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what it was like. The question is, so Schweitzgibble, was there something further in your experience, something besides the imagery, something that might qualify as a distinctive phenomenology of thinking? Try it again if you like. Is the answer so obvious that you can't imagine someone going wrong about it? Could you, be, could you conclude that I was wrong? I wasn't thinking of the Prince of Wales. Is it as obvious as that your desk has drawers, your shirt is yellow, your shutters are cracked? Those are all claims about the external world. Those I'm very clear and sharp on. I feel confidence about those. I have a, a, a certainty about those being true. But the fact that I'm thinking of the Prince of Wales now is getting murkier by the moment. The fact that the shutters are cracked or that the shirt is yellow claims about the external world, those are sharp and clear and understood, and I have a high confidence attached to them, but the fact that I'm thinking about the Prince of Wales is this sort of nebulous, vague, amorphous feeling. He says, there's nothing infallible, clear, or obvious here either. Okay, so the result then is that the introspection of current conscious experience, far from being secure, nearly infallible, is faulty, untrustworthy and misleading, not just possibly mistaken, but massively and per per pervasively so. And I don't think it's just me here in the dark, says Schweitzgebel. It's most of us. If you stop and introspect now, there's likely very little you should confidently say you know about your current phenomenology. So, says Schweitzgebel, Descartes had it backwards. I know the outside world far better than I know anything about my mental states. I know better what's in the burrito I'm eating than I know my gustatory experience as I eat it. I'm much sure, I'm much more sure that it has cheese in it, but the report that I'm experiencing cheesiness is far more elusive, indirect, vague, and unstable. So Schweitzgebel's argument in this series of provocative questions and, and um, experiments, sort of thought experiments, flips Cartesian epistemology on its head. All right, so that's my discussion of Schweitzgebel that rounds out our full discussion of Descartes, Nisbet Camp wilson and Schweitzgebel on whether and to what extent introspection can inform us about the nature of the mind.